I am pleased to welcome you all to, again, our webinar on using learning huddles to improve teaching and learning. We have goals for today's webinar. Um, we're gonna learn together about the theory and practice of teacher learning huddles and how they reflect an improvement science plan, do, study, act inquiry cycle. Um, and we're gonna hear from examples in Washoe County School District to understand some of the design features and the leverage points um, to facilitate learning about instruction. Um, and finally, we're gonna explore some ways to support teacher learning through inquiry um, in their context. So again, um, the examples today will have to do with writing curriculum, but this can really be applied to many different content areas. So we have an agenda. This is what we'll cover in the next hour. So just a bit about who we are uh, organizing this webinar. So the Regional Educational Laboratory West, or REL West, is one of 10 national education labs that are funded by the Institute for Education Sciences at the Department of Education. And our projects and partnerships are focused in California, Utah, Nevada, and Arizona. But of course, our resources and webinars like this are available for anyone who is interested. And our mission is to translate research into practice among practitioners and policymakers, and really to support data-driven decision-making in education. So I'm pleased uh, to introduce our three excellent speakers that we have lined up for today. So first of all, Kim Austin is a senior researcher in the K through six literacy partnership lead for REL West with expertise in literacy, online learning, professional development, evaluation, and learning theory. And the next person that's joining us today is Daryl Kiernan. She's the early literacy learning facilitator for Nevada's Northwest Regional Professional Development Program, which provides professional learning opportunities with the goal of improving student performance. Um, and she's been really involved with this project, so welcome, Daryl. And finally, Sola Takahashi is a Senior Research Associate and Improvement Science Specialist here at REL West. Um, and she's involved in a number of projects that are working to integrate continuous improvement methods into our coaching and research. Welcome, Sola. So thank you again, everyone, for being with us today. And Kim, I will let you take it from here. So we are a partnership of four organizations. As Laura mentioned, uh, some of us are affiliated with Regional Educational Laboratory West at West Ed, Sola and I are. Um, we are partnering with schools in Washoe County School, School District in Reno, Nevada. Um, and we have some of those folks on the line as well. Uh, the Center for the Collaborative Classroom is also an important partner. They provide the curriculum that's the focus of this work as well as professional learning expertise. And lastly, Nevada's Northwest Regional Professional Development Program is a partner in facilitating all the professional learning uh, uh, activities that we are all engaged in. So what, what are we doing? We, uh, in a nutshell, are an improvement partnership focused on writing instruction K-6. And our work initially is in two elementary schools in Reno, Nevada, working with all of the teachers there and the principal principals and their on-site coaches as well as Washoe district coaches and our aim is to after we refine this approach to professional learning to scale to more schools in Washoe. It's a five-year project and we just finished really our first year of implementation for school year and we're entering into year two. Our goals are to ultimately improve student writing by leveraging an improvement approach to shift teacher practice we are also learning together about how to support students as writers. Uh, we, all of us are learners. We're, and that's all wrapped in an effort to build district capacity to sustain and scale the work over time. So that's at a high level what we're doing. And where did we start? So any improvement project starts with defining the problem. What's the gap between where we are currently and where we want to be? And the first gap that uh, popped out at us was really around writing performance and uh, student achievement in SBAC uh, was revealing that at least half the students weren't meeting proficiency. Um, so that was a concern. Um, in addition, there's no writing curriculum in place uh, in, in the two schools we worked with and in the majority of schools in the county. 
Um, third, there's a lack of ongoing professional development to support writing instruction. Um, and lastly, through our partnership with the Collaborative Classroom, we learned that there's a wide variation, um, which is quite typical, in implementation across classrooms. So the curriculum really look, looks very different from classroom to classroom, and we were curious about that, how we could reduce the variation across classrooms. That's where we started. And together with the Collaborative Classroom and also with a, a number of research resources, we developed this North Star Goal, which has four parts. Our aim is to develop a community of independent writers by supporting students to feel engaged and motivated to write, to collaborate well with partners, um, both in whole group lessons and in writing, to write consistently for 20 to 30 minutes per day. That's a research-based recommendation, um, daily time for writing. Obviously, that will vary according to grade level and whether you're at the beginning of the year or the end of the year. Um, and lastly, uh, we, we have put a lot of effort into thinking about how to improve writing after writing conferences, which is another key component of the, of the curriculum. Now, this, the, this represents our North Star goal. But we think that the process that we're sharing today could really apply to any content area and um, grade spans for that matter. And as I mentioned, uh, we used a number of research resources to inform our North Star goal. This is one from IES, and I think there's a link to that in the chat, um, which really details very, very specific recommendations for instruction in writing. So how will we get there? We have our goal, we have our partners, we have our site. How, how will we get from A to B? Um, so this is our working theory of the key drivers for improvement. Um, we theorize that a common curriculum would help teachers literally be on the same page, talking about the same units, the same weeks of instruction, and the same lessons. And we thought that was important in terms of building on the, the PLC structures that were already there, that they were talking about common lessons and lesson structures. Um, we also believe that collaboration is important and this with a particular focus on research-based practices. Uh, inquiry cycles is something we'll dig into in a bit. Um, that, that's what really drives the improvement process is the groups of teachers engaging in inquiry and collaboration. And lastly, support for leadership, um, which is critical. We won't go into detail about that today, but we recognize that all levels of the system are important in supporting teacher collaboration. A little bit about the curriculum. As I mentioned, our partner, the Collaborative Classroom, they were formerly called the Developmental Studies Center, so you might know them by that name. Um, they have a curriculum with a very predictable lesson structure, which has been helpful to us in our inquiry with teachers. Uh, there's always a lesson, there's always writing time, and it, it concludes with a share and reflecting time. They use a writing workshop approach, which probably many of you are familiar with, and their pedagogy integrates the social and the academic. So that's just a, a taste of the, the content and context for these collaborative sessions that we're about to describe. So here's what year one looked like. Um, we took our North Star goals and we said, okay, what if everyone in the school was focusing around a common topic? And a nice initial topic at the beginning of the year seemed to be establishing those social routines. So in those first few huddles, we help teachers just become familiar with the discussion protocol that we'll describe um, before they did any data collection. In the winter, we focused on protecting time for independent writing, and that's where they started tracking how long did the lesson take, how much time did students have to write each day, and then they would huddle around their data. And lastly, we focused on frequent and effective conferring, um, which is probably one of the more challenging topics because it gets right to the heart of instruction. How are you supporting individual students in their writing? So this is our inquiry cycle. Um, this year, with some feedback from teachers, we decided to give teacher teams an opportunity to choose their topic. So the inquiry cycle begins with choice of topic, and there's a discussion around, you know, What's the current situation in my classroom and where do I have motivation to collect some data and try out some changes? Each team collects data around their topic to better understand the problem, identify gaps in their practice. So maybe they're only getting to one student conference a day and they'd like to get to two or three. And they start to generate the reasons why there are these gaps. Um, they also develop some change ideas after they 
look at their initial data and move on to that green bubble where they conduct a small test in their classroom. They try something out, something relatively simple. It could be as simple as, I'm gonna set a timer for myself to make sure that the lesson part of my day doesn't creep into the writing part of my day. Um, they collect some more data to see how that change idea went and take a look at it again in their groups and discuss what did you learn from your data? Did your change idea work? Um, are you gonna go ahead and adopt it as a regular part of your practice or tweak it um, or try something else? And Sol is gonna give another recap of this inquiry cycle in a moment, so you'll see it again. All right, um, this is Sola. I'm gonna uh, take it from here for a little bit to talk about how learning huddles fit within the work of improvement science and network improvement communities. Um, huddles are becoming an increasingly common practice in the healthcare space. There are a lot of hospitals that um, have huddles going on on a regular basis um, with staff members from um, various, in various roles coming together to see how things are going and supporting the next steps of the work that they're doing. Um, we have looked in particular to Cincinnati Children's Hospital, which is one of the premier healthcare organizations using quality improvement methods. And uh, what we um, heard about particularly was their work with the Cincinnati Public Schools. Um, they are partnering with the public schools there in order to uh, target early grade literacy. And what we heard in there in describing their work that was really appealing to us were these four features. Um, one is that these huddles are relatively quick. So these are not one or two hour meetings. Um, they're really meant to be short touch points um, for, for the teachers and other staff who are working on an issue. Because they are quick, it is easier to have them happen on a more regular basis. And um, by virtue of being able to check in on a regular basis, you can really continue a conversation thread in a focal area without having to catch everyone up all the time about what has been going on. Um, and so they are focused on a topic. And it's also important that everyone speaks. Um, this is both for engagement, so that because we want, you know, in, in order to achieve our aim at scale, we want everyone to participate. Um, and it is also to leverage the wisdom that everyone brings to the table, um, given where they sit in the organization and what they are expert in and know about. And I want to zoom out a little bit here and put the huddles within the context of an improvement science effort. Um, this is called the Model for Improvement and um, is developed by the Associates for Process Improvement. This is, a, this is a framework to think about an improvement effort. And it starts with this question of what specifically are we trying to accomplish? And this is often answered in an aim statement that specifies uh, a timeline and uh, particular metrics that you're interested in tracking. And next it leads to what changes might we make and why? So we're trying to get to this aim. Uh, what is it that we're gonna do in our system? What interventions, what changes are we making in order to reach our aim? And why do we think those changes work? So this is where the theory articulation becomes uh, forefront. We wanna be really clear about what we think the changes are that will make a difference for the aim that we're shooting for so that we have uh, opportunities to learn along the way about our theory and to revise those theories and to revise our mental models sometimes um, depending on what we're encountering when we do the work on the ground. How will we know that a change is an improvement? And this is where the measurement system comes in. So we want more than just our gut feelings about how things went. We really want data to, to get a sense of um, how things are progressing. And once we answer these questions and we have some change ideas that we want to test, and that's where the plan, do, study, act cycle comes into play, where we take a change idea and, and put it into practice, um, probably in the beginning at a small scale and quickly, so that we can learn quickly from um, how that change idea interacts with the system. So Kim discussed this inquiry cycle um, previously, and what I wanted to do was to make the connection between the cycle and the plan, do, study, act cycle, and specifically where the huddles come into play. 
So as a starting point, um, teachers are in their grade level teams identifying an improvement focus. They're looking at data, identifying the gaps, um, discussing why they think this is happening and leaving these meetings with uh, some clear next steps of things they wanna try in their practice. They go and do the change in their practice. They conduct that, that small test and collect data. And then they come back to then study what they learned from this test of change. Um, and this is again where the huddle comes into play. The teachers are back together again, and they revisit what they left the prior meeting with, um, and then make some next decisions about next steps. And, and that's the act portion, um, adopt, adapt, or abandon are some of the options here. And they lead into the next PDSA cycle. Um, I, th I think what I, what I hear often is that, um, that teachers tend to plan and do, that this, this is commonly occurring, that the plan do part of it, um, but often this can look like plan do, plan do, um, and it's really the, the study and act thing, parts of the cycle um, that, that can make this feel new and different to really be sure that we're coming back and revisiting our, our theories about what's going on and assessing our change ideas and, and seeing how that went. And as I mentioned and, and as um, Kim discussed as well, it's not just about one PDSA, they really do build on each other. And from one cycle to the next, uh, what we're aiming for is to build confidence in the change ideas. And in the beginning, this may be, you know, I tried this out and it seems like this is a modification I want to make that it seemed to be working, but there are some tweaks I want to make to it. And so we're going to make some changes and try it again. Um, and it's also over time, well, it seems to work in one classroom. Is it going to work in another? And it's through replication of the PDSAs and these change ideas in various contexts um, that we begin to get, build confidence in the change idea to modify it, refine it, um, and also to adapt it. Are there things that uh, adaptations that make this change idea work for certain contexts versus others. And so this is a, the longer term um, of this work is really building confidence in, in a set of change ideas that we think um, are, are helpful for the aim that we are um, shooting for. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Kim to talk a little bit about what this has looked like in practice. Thanks, Ola. Yeah, and I see there, um folks are trying to get interested in the details. So this is the details or the nuts and bolts. What, what do learning huddles look like? Um, so our learning huddles, and this might differ from the hospital setting where they might be even shorter, are 30 minutes and uh, they follow a discussion protocol in grade level teams. They are guided by the grade level team members. They're really um, independ independently um, facilitated. So if you are in a room with multiple huddles going on, you'll look around and see every grade level team engaged and self-facilitated. Uh, each is focused on a research-based topic, as I mentioned before, and they're really grounded in reflecting on instructional practice with evidence. So um, one of the comments in the chat was, sounds, sounds like a PLC structure, and it very, very well may be similar to what your PLCs look like. Um, however, we've noticed that people define that PLC time um, differently depending on where you are and what your goals are. Um, and lastly, there's a, a concerted focus on equitable talk. So there, there are multiple opportunities for every person in the huddle to speak. And I think that's really important. So what does it look like step by step? This is a document that's an annotated learning huddle that you have access to and I believe Laura has included a link to so you can read the fine print, but in a nutshell, uh, every learning huddle begins with uh, choosing roles, and those roles include discussion facilitator, note taker, timekeeper, and process observer. And sometimes they rotate and sometimes they don't. It just depends on the team's preference. Uh, we also focus a, quite a bit on norms in the initial huddles. Now in year two, the, the teams are really feeling pretty well normed, and um, that's a part that we actually took out for the year two huddles. Um, we learned from Cincinnati, there's this really nice starting point, which is the one word check-in. How are you feeling about your group's topic? So how are you feeling 
about uh, collaboration in your classroom and partner work and how that's looking and teachers say one word, which uh, is sometimes difficult at first, but uh, that way every voice is heard right off the bat. The next part of the huddle protocol is around Robin. So every single person has their data in front of them uh, and we'll show you some examples of what that looks like in just a minute and they will describe their data. So the data wise folks will, this will feel familiar. Start with description and observation and move to interpretation and um, finally identifying some gaps that they might want to close in their uh, next action period. The fourth part of the protocol is more open-ended. We didn't want it to feel completely lockstep and structured all the way through. So that discussion number four really is pick one data set or one challenge or one issue and let's really unpack it together. And that's a, always an exciting part to watch because ideas are just flying. Um, and lastly, every huddle concludes with uh, the note taker noting down what are our next steps, either what did we learn from this action period or what do we wanna try next based on um, what we learned in this, this action period. I'll turn it over to Daryl to share a few examples. Okay, so here you see a sample of what data collection looked like. Um, teachers in this, this represents a four week cycle of data collection around lesson writing time. And the goal here was to provide 20 minutes of writing time every day. So you can see that teachers recorded total lesson time. The being a writer uh, lessons typically have three parts, getting ready to write, uh, writing time for students, and an opportunity to share and reflect. Teachers recorded yes or no, whether or not they uh, were able to get to each portion of the lesson. And then you can see the time that the students actually spent writing. And some teachers also had an opportunity to collect a few notes about the total lesson, which you see in the last column. This slide shows uh, data collection. Teachers also collected data about conferring with the goal of meeting to two, with two to three students per day. Here you can see a variety of approaches to this. Some teachers created their own trackers. Um, some teachers came up with the idea of grouping students so that they could then individually meet for, with each student. One teacher used bookmarks uh, that you see in the right hand corner. And the idea here was for students to be able to place a bookmark in their writing folders to indicate when they wanted a writing conference. This shows how the data was displayed. This is an example of what happened in one teacher's classroom. She collected data about writing time with a median of about eight minutes um, of writing time for students. And her goal was to increase that number to really get to the 20 minutes. So she came up with a change idea, and her change idea was to reduce teacher talk in the first portion of the lesson. And after she introduced this idea um, into her instruction, she found out that students' writing time increased to 15 minutes. So thinking about what is different about these learning huddles, and I saw some questions that came up in the chat about that. So in, in a learning huddle, what we've noticed that's different is that everyone is engaged. Um, teachers are talking about instruction and we're hearing honest reflection about teaching. Some teachers have said that this is the most productive their PLCs have been because the discussions are focused. We've noticed that teachers are taking ownership of the process as well. Um, we see that they're able to put ideas to the test from their own experience rather than from uh, something that we might suggest. And then they see those ideas evolve and actually make a difference with their students. Uh, in year two, we're noticing that teachers have internalized the protocol. It doesn't seem to be as lockstep anymore. And it's starting to become a more natural way for them to have a conversation teachers are more comfortable going straight to the data and discussing next steps. And um, it appears that they've internalized this type of inquiry and the steps. So you've been taken through uh, what a huddle looks like, some examples of data, and I'm gonna turn it over now to Laura, who is gonna give you an opportunity to think about how this connects to your own experience. Go ahead. Any question, the most recent one that came in, what suggestions do you have for helping teachers to select 
appropriate and practical data to collect? Maybe we can start that's with That's great. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm, I will start an answer and then maybe hand it over to Sola to reflect on that one as well. Um, so that's been a really interesting process. We didn't just say, oh, go, you know, figure out what data to collect. We actually, for each of the, the four topics we mentioned earlier, we gave them some choices. Um, so as you saw with conferring, they um, could keep a tracker that um, just kept track of how many conferences they were holding. They could keep a tracker that had the topics included. Um, that one teacher used a bookmark and that's how she um, actually solved the problem of how do I know which students want and need a conference. Um, so it's been a combination of us sharing things like exit tickets and temperature checks as options and also teachers coming up with their own trackers. Um, but it is challenging to keep the data collection focused enough for um, really good discussions and so that you could see a change over time. So I was working with a team a couple weeks ago that said, we just wanna see if the students have improved their writing. And as you can imagine, that's a much broader topic than how many conferences did I have? So that, that was a conversation about, well, how, how are you gonna determine what improved writing is and um, what your goals are? So you can imagine the, how these conversations can get quite rich. Zola, do you want to reflect on that one? Sure. Uh, just to add on to what you're saying, I want to focus on the, the practical part of it in particular, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I think there are these nuts and bolts logistics of figuring out how to get data on a regular basis that uh, is timely. So teachers are getting the, getting the information that they want from that data quickly. Um, and so we have we've done things like um, setting up some google sheets where when teachers enter some numbers it automatically updates um, a line graph or a, a run chart so they have that visual uh, really in real time as they go um, but there's also just the the data collection part of this um, you know, we've explored things like, you know, there are these exit tickets, but, you know, that means someone has to collect that paper, input, count things up, input the spreadsheet, and that could be harder um, and just more time consuming than, than what teachers have time for. Um, so we've explored things like having um, a chart paper where students put stickies on in different boxes so we can, so it's easier to count that up or for younger students doing a, a thumbs up and thumbs down on about certain questions and teachers counting that up. So uh, we've been trying to, to think um, pretty broadly about, about how to help this to be um, really practical and doable within the time frame um, of, of teachers work lives. We had another um, question. I think it came from Mary. Does the success of this approach depend on teachers having high quality strategies to discuss in the first place? I guess I'll, I'll start off because uh, I did start to, to write in the chat um, about that and then I'll, I'll also pass it off to Kim and Darrell to, to pick up on that as well. Um, uh, yes, it's, it is helpful um, to, to have high quality strategies. Uh, we have the great benefit in this project of having the collaborative classroom curriculum um, to begin with as, as a starting point. So um, it's not that teachers are you know, inventing everything um, as they go along. They, they do have a great curriculum that they're drawing on. Um, but in terms of the particular change ideas of, of how to make this um, go well, to give those to give students those learning opportunities, um, yes, it, it is you know helpful to have change ideas that are you know high high leverage, high quality, and we have folks like instructional coaches, for example, who. Um, are part of these conversations. Sometimes collaborative classroom folks are able to be a part of these conversations as well um, and to help refine some of those change ideas. But it's also, I think, you know, a balance with the, the really critical teacher agency piece of this. Um, and so we, this is not about us telling teachers what to do. This is really very much about um, teachers being in the driving seat of identifying changes to try and 
um, really leveraging their professional uh, knowledge and wisdom as well. Um, and so there, a lot of the change ideas are generated by the, the, the teachers and, um, and, and there, I think the data, the data do play this critical role of being the, the mirror against, you know, you, you thought this was gonna be a, a good idea and then how did it, how, what do the data tell us about how this went um, really helps to um, refine the quality of those change ideas over time as well. I see another question about the change ideas from Christy. She says, I'm curious if you're tracking some of the actions that resulted in positive change to share with others. And yes, that to me, that's the, the most exciting part of this work is when you see a change idea that had a positive impact. And then our challenge as the improvement hub is to figure out how to get those ideas to spread. So initially, it's very natural. Change ideas are shared in those grade level teams and um, teachers are borrowing or are mirroring their colleagues. Um, but we also meet with team leads so that they can share change ideas across grade levels. Um, and we have an ongoing list of, of both the challenges that teachers have brought up and the change ideas that um, they've had that have seemed to make a, a difference. And as I mentioned earlier, they aren't super complex. Um, some of them are, are as simple as um, be more specific with the focus of the conference. Um, meet with students in small groups so that I can confer with more across the course of the week. Um, preview lessons to determine the most important parts so that I can um, keep to my timing and my pacing. Set a timer. Uh, reduce the number of students who share out during the lesson. So that was several teachers found that they called on four or five or six students to share out, they quickly were eating up their independent writing time. So they could either reduce it or have them turn to their partner. So very sort of straightforward things to implement, but they seem to make a difference. So what have we learned so far? Um, I mentioned some of the challenges earlier. Uh, from huddle to huddle, discussion facilitation skills do vary. Um, you'll have some facilitators who are very um, sort of hands-on and make sure the protocol is like step-by-step -step, and some who are a little more laid back and that yields different types of discussions. So it's something that we um, are focusing on with our team leads and helping them to reflect on how did that go? Did you stick to the protocol? How was your timing? Did everyone get to talk? Um, so that's been one of the challenges that we've sort of fed right back into, okay, you know, how can we support that moving forward? Um, protocols, if you've ever experienced one, I remember the first time I experienced one, it felt very constraining, like um, almost too lockstep and people couldn't talk when they wanted to talk. And we definitely had teachers who experienced that at the beginning. Um, but what's great and what Darrell alluded to is over time, uh, the whole process becomes more natural and the teachers are doing the steps of the protocol without really calling them out or in some cases even referring to the agenda so um, and that's the goal it's the goal isn't to to learn a step-by-step -step process the goal is to have certain kinds of conversations with equi equitable talk grounded in data um, we talked a little bit about the data challenge both collecting and tracking and choosing um, what data sources to use um, and I'm sure a lot of you can relate to the challenge of well here's the data let's try to stay in it you know for a little while before we pop off to another uh, topic in the conversation so just staying in the analysis has been a challenge data collection is definitely another layer uh, for really really busy elementary school teachers teaching multiple subjects um, but for the most part, teachers have said that it's doable. So while well, they initially have felt like, oh, it's one more thing, after they collect data for seven to 10 days, um, that for, for the most part, they've said, I, I can do this, and it's actually really helping me see things in a, in a whole new way. And lastly, cultivating an improvement mindset. So this process is really holding up a mirror to your own practice. And saying, gosh, did I get to writing this week? Did I get to conferring this week? And it's not comfortable. Um, 
but over time, I think we've been able to, to support and develop that culture of, yeah, I kind of missed the mark there, but um, here's my idea for how to uh, close that gap. So on the success front, um, as I mentioned, we've seen a really high level of engagement in the learning huddles themselves. At both schools, they happen at around 2.30 on a Wednesday afternoon and all of the teachers are in the same room. So they're all in there at their own tables, their grade level tables. And it really is like a hive. And walking around that room, you wouldn't see people on their phone or um, doing other things. They, these teachers are really engaged in the process. And we think that's due in part to the sort of supportive backbone of the protocol structure. Um, they are collecting data about their own practice. And we actually think that's unique. You know, so often data discussions these days are focused on student data. This is about instruction and its impact on learning. They're noticing things in their practice they didn't notice before. Um, probably some of you have had the experience of once you start tracking your st how many steps you take every day or every week, you start to notice patterns um, that you probably wouldn't have if you just had to recall by memory, gee, how much did I walk this week? So tracking itself is a powerful change idea. They're reflecting on their instruction in, in new ways, um, not just what's in the curriculum or what strategy are we working on, but you know, how, how am I building my classroom community over time? They're making changes. It's not you know, necessarily across the board in every classroom. We've seen you know, all positive indicators, but a, a number of bright spots that lead us to believe that we're headed in the right direction. They are developing that improvement mindset. They're using the language of improvement um, what's your change idea? What are you going to try out? Um, so it's becoming a little more natural than it uh, was in year one. And um, my favorite part is they're sharing change ideas with colleagues. I feel like that's the gold. And if we can surface those and spread them throughout the system and other folks can learn from them, um, that's a really exciting piece of this work. So this is, we wanted to kind of summarize what we think is different about this approach and some of the chat has sort of pushed on that question. Well, it sounds like this and it's sort of like that. Here, here are some of the differences that we've identified. Professional development sort of stereotypically tends to be the one shot workshop where experts are outside of the classroom. There's not a lot of choice and um, knowledge is in quotes delivered. Um, as you all know, those of you who involved with PLCs, it's a, that's a very different model for learning. Um, that it's learning to improve. It's regular and ongoing. It requires a certain kind of commitment. Everyone needs to show up and participate. Uh, the experts are inside and outside the classroom. I think for the first part of the year, last year, the teachers are kind of looking around for, where's our being a writer expert? And then they realized at a certain point, oh, okay, we're the experts. So we know our classroom is the best. We know our challenge is the best. And we can help each other. Um, we're implementing more choice as we go, which acknowledges and supports teacher agency. Teachers are really accountable to their students. Did they get their writing time? Did they get their conference? Are they collaborating effectively? It's both individual and collective learning, and knowledge is developed over time through testing changes in that inquiry cycle. We wanted to end with teacher voices. Um, wish I had some actual teacher voices, but in lieu of that, we have some quotes. We thought we'd, rather than reading them, we'd just let you peruse them, take them in, and um, there's also an opportunity to ask any remaining questions about any of the resources available um, or anything you didn't get a chance to say. Yeah, Kim, there's been a few additional questions added to the chat, and I see Christine's been responding, but I thought maybe we could end with a few of these. So the first one is Richard wrote in, how much time was spent on the front end to familiarize everyone to understanding um, the purpose and use of the improvement huddles and improvement science um, so that they were used well? Oh, I love that question. Um, so we thought a lot about how much improvement language and improvement theory to introduce at the beginning, including the terms the Plan, Do, Study, Act. And we actually went uh, towards the direction of let's try something first and then reflect on what we did. So kind of do first um, and then introduce some of the theory. So we had a summer institute um, with both 
the teachers from both schools where um, we introduced the curriculum once so they were brand new to the curriculum. So they needed to get up and running with that. But we also did a huddle with them and we spent a lot of time both introducing it, um, each part of it, kind of going over each part and the purpose of each part. Um, and then we spent a lot of time debriefing it. How did that feel? How did that go for you? What was that like? Um, and that's where we, you know, people were enabled people to say that was kind of uncomfortable or that was kind of cool. Um, one thing some of our partners have been noticing is when they go out and try a version of this for other purposes or with other groups, um, if you don't introduce initially the, the purpose and the rationale behind it, it can be a lot more difficult. It doesn't go quite as smoothly. Um, another thing that, that we learned along the way is that focus, that topic focus was really important. So if the topic was something like, how do we improve your students' writing, that's much too broad. Um, so that's, that institute was really important. And um, the inquiry cycle graphic that we showed earlier is also something that we're using to help teachers understand the purpose of the huddles and um, the structure of the inquiry cycle.